Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for joining and those online, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are watching from. So today I'm going to be talking about securing DevOps, where to start and what to measure. My name is Stefania Chaplin, I'm DevStepOps, you can find me on Twitter, I don't have a Mastodon yet, I'm not that cool, but maybe eventually. Also connect with me on LinkedIn or check out my brand new website. It's only a month old, so if anyone in UX wants to give me any advice or SEO, awesome. But anyway, back to the talk. I always keep my agenda purposefully vague so that it adds an element of suspense. So the fundamental questions, what are we here to talk about? Who is involved? How are we going to get there? Why are we even speaking about this? Summary and Q&A. And to keep it fun, I'm going to have little quizzes. Um, so we don't have a mic to hand around. So instead, maybe you know, think of the answer, and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the answer. So, um, who am I? A little bit about myself. So I used to be a developer, uh, Python, Java, REST APIs. So if someone presented to me a JSON, I'm one of those cool people that can tell you exactly what Python command you need to get the exact key or value you want, because that's just how my brain works. Then I moved into the wonderful world of security, looking at DevSecOps, AppSec, and CloudSec. So working at companies like Secure Code Warrior, Sonotype, and now I work at GitLab, the DevOps platform. But as you can see from the slides, this isn't a GitLab talk, it's a DevStepOps talk. <laughs> Outside of that, as Sam said, I do a lot of surfing. I am really into my yoga, and I also have a lot of tropical plants and tend to travel to warm tropical countries because surfing in the cold isn't very fun. <laughs> so, to my talk, now what? So, we're about to come up with the first quiz, and I'm going to start you off easy. So, quiz time. What is DevSecOps? So hopefully, actually, I'll do a show of hands. Who has heard of DevSecOps before? OK, good. OK, you're in the right room. Well done, everyone. So um, most people, when they think of DevSecOps, development, security, and operations. Tick. Well done, everyone who thought that. You get a gold star. I don't have any Amazon gift cards, my bad, but maybe next time. Um, but actually, this is a definition that I found that I quite like because it's not just about you know, who's involved. It's about culture. It's about shared responsibility. And it's about integrating security throughout the entire IT and really doing it secure by design. So when we think of DevSecOps, a lot of the time you, know, you have your developers developing involved with you know, planning, coding, doing the build and test. And then some people think, oh yeah, security, we're scanning, um, you know, we, we create our you know, release candidate and we're doing some scans, and yeah, we're doing, we're doing DevSecOps, we've got security. But really it's about having security <coughs> embedded at each stage. So planning, are you doing threat modeling? Do you have scans in the IDE? Are you doing, yes, scans as part of your CI, but also moving into ops. Logging and monitoring is a bit like eating your fruits and vegetables. I am vegan, so I do eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. But it's really a case of when you do get hacked, which there's not much wood around, but yeah, touching all the wood that I can, how long is it going to take you to notice? So there was a large credit rating agency in 2017 that got hacked. And so if you were going to go for a mortgage, they're the kind of people who would check your credit. It was 150 million people. Um, it was just before GDPR. So it would have been, you know, to put it in perspective, their market capitalization, their stock price, they lost about a quarter of their value. Um, and it took them four months to notice they'd been hacked. Because the very first hack, it was an open source component, was just, who am I? Um, and then once someone does, who am I? Maybe I'll walk over. So if someone does, who am I? And then, um, oh yeah, now I can't see. Oh, wait, I'll see off that. Um, someone does, who am I? And then, OK, oh, uh, I'm user 5000. OK, oh, now I'm admin. Oh, what? let's have a look at these folders. Oh, now we can move around. Oh, now we're in ETC. Now we're in ETC password. OK, cool, let's do some damage. So it was about 150 million people. I, I travel a lot. So I was in Sweden talking about it. That's 14 times the population of Sweden. 
Um, and it's about France and Germany put together, and it was about two thirds of America um, at the time. So this is why, you know, on the upside, logging and monitoring is important, and also incident response. Once you know something's going bad, you know, how long is it going to take you to notice? So. Coming back to OWASP, there was a recent change. Oh, the OWASP top 10 changes every three years. So this was the um, top 21. And this is for web applications. And what we saw is the new number four. So this for me, because I really do love security, this was really exciting because with insecure design, what we're seeing is it's actually a component of 40 <coughs> CWEs. So a CWE is a type of vulnerability. So for example, uh, number 10, SSRF, that's a type of vulnerability. That has one CWE mapped. Whilst insecure design is actually a sum of a lot more, like 40 CWEs, and about you know, how, you know, how we need to design our systems securely. So it's really shifting left with security. It's thinking about stuff like threat modeling, thinking about our systems, about code quality, um, <coughs> etc. So, and why are we here? Why is this all important? So hopefully this chart may seem familiar. If it isn't and you're working for security and no one believes you and you're fighting your case, just show them this. At IBM do a really good version of it. Um, and so did NIST as well, actually. Um, but what we can see, even judging by the colors, if we shift left, so we're in requirements gathering and coding, it's not that expensive to uh, fix a problem. I do a lot of sales training, and the way I used to describe it is, so if I'm writing a book, I'm writing my autobiography, and I'm writing it, and it's in Google Docs or Word, and I notice I've spelt my name wrong. Oops, my bad. It's a lot easier for me to fix it whilst I am in my local environment in my IDE but what happens is, okay, now we have the, the prototype, we're about to send it to Amazon to distribute, and oh no, all of a sudden we get into production. I have 100,000 versions of my autobiography out in Amazon and other retailers, and my name is spelt wrong on the front. So it's really about, with shifting left, try and shift left, as, as the name suggests, as early as you can. <laughs> So, common pain points, and there's quite a few, but I just wanted to highlight a couple. So, security is the bad guy. Um, what we, I used to, I've been going to talks for a while, and the one that used to stick up was security, you're going through a bridge, and security is like the ugly troll underneath that's like, thou shalt not pass. <laughs> um, and so now, security, and with DevSecOps, we're trying to get this level of collaboration, Security don't really want to be the bad guy. We're trying to help you, and especially if you're working in highly regulated industries, uh, such as financial services, your security and audit are just trying to make sure we don't lose you know, everyone's money. So especially when you have silos, which I'll talk about in a moment, that can be a real issue. So next one, vulnerabilities known and unknown make it to production. And it's worth not noting both of those because you might think you have problems, but depending on how thorough your security is, it's like an iceberg, you might have a lot more problems than you think you do. Um, a lot of the time, I speak, to, I speak to organizations, big, small, all across Europe, all the different sectors, and some of them are like, yeah, 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 we're doing security. We've got Sonicube. We're looking at our static codes. And it's like, OK, have you thought about your dependencies? Does log4j ring a bell? Does that at all sound familiar for you? And then normally mentioning of log4j, everyone kind of shudders because that was, that was a pretty dark time. And for those that don't know, that was a log4j is a Java framework. So it's used for logging. And I used to work in software scanning. And almost every single Java application I ever saw would have log4j. And it was a nice neutral blue, no, no problems, so, so no issues. There was a problem with this very common component. And not only was it just um, a problem, it was a 10 out of 10 problem. And when I worked in open source, me and the other solutions architects would compare notes. We'd be like, oh, wow, I found a 10. You know, Django version 0.7. This is a good one, because 10s are rare. So to have, if you think of attack vector, if you think about risk, as in like width and depth, this was a very big problem. So with vulnerabilities, you really want to think about what you know and what you don't know. Zero day vulnerabilities come out all the time, so it's important to be on top of them. Because as the name suggests, delays, fails, or worse, um, that downward emoji graph, that unfortunately could be your stock price if you're not careful, because no one wants to end up on the front page of the news. And what I've noticed, especially you know, 
I say colloquially. Um, now that security and ransomware, when we had the kernel pipeline and we've had you know, loads of different attacks, it's on BBC News now. My family actually know what I do, which is pretty cool. Um, so you really don't want to be on the front page. And securing DevOps, which I'm about to talk about, is a really um, good way to avoid that. I'm doing good. Every five minutes, I'm going to switch over. And <laughs> uh, have a drink. Oh, I think I've got a quiz. So who? This is, this is a little bit harder. So, and then I can have a drink. What is the difference between project mindset versus product mindset? I'll do a little show of hands. Who has heard of either of these terms before? OK, so yeah, I told you, the quiz got a bit harder, you know? <laughs> um, if you do want to know more before I give away the answer, there's a great book that I'd recommend reading about this. Um, so, um, if you have ever heard of microservices, which are a pretty awesome way to construct applications, monolith versus microservices, and there's this great guy called Martin Fowler, and he wrote the nine awesome things about microservices. It wasn't called the nine awesome things, but that's how I remember it. I think it's just nine things. Uh, but one of them was specifically this, project mindset and product mindset. So when we think of project mindset, uh, think of Gantt charts. So you know how it used to be. Okay, in weeks one to three, we're going to do requirements, and then we're going to do coding, and then testing, and then now we're really over budget, and we're behind schedule, and everyone in the CMO and everything is going behind us. You know, it's all stressful. Who can we sign this off to get this done? So project, like the name suggests, you have these different stages. You have Gantt charts, but it's very, it's very siloed. It's like, okay, I'm done, handed over, and it's very similar to say, waterfall uh, from, the, from the distant path. When we move to product mindset, what instead we're getting is we're focusing, when we think of product, think of our product team. Product team focuses on our customers. We listen to our customers. What do our customers want to see? What are they interested? Let's turn the customer voice into a product, and then, and then we build it, and then deploy it, secure it, etc. So when we have a product mindset, it's much more about the customer voice. It's much more about the roadmap and strategic vision. So it's much more about outcomes. And when you think of it like that, security isn't you know, a line in the GAN chart. Security is a quality check. Security is part of the product, because if you have an insecure product, then or that's, you know, that's low quality. That's, um, that's not going to be good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my silos. So in the, yeah, talking about who. So got my developer, and I used to be one, so I can say these. Uh, so developers, we like, we've got, we're KPI'd. We've got to do, um, you know, we've got to focus on features. We have to like, we like to keep on top of what's on the new and shiny, and like, you know, how we can use open source frameworks or libraries to make our job easier to fit, you know, our product related deadlines. Then we have security. And what you tend to find is you have about, 100 developers, on average, to one security. And that will vary wildly. I remember I was seeing like a, a medium-sized enterprise in Paris a few years ago. And there was one guy exasperated. And he's like, yeah, I'm actually after this. Like, <coughs> come summer, I'm, I'm actually quitting. And I'm just going to drive around a while. Because he was the one security for 300 developers. And if you imagine trying to secure the workload of 300 other people, it's kind of a little bit tricky. And then you tend to have if you're looking at those ratios, about, give or take, about 10 ops. And they all have different goals. So developers, developers want things fast. Security wants things secure. And then ops wants things stable. So that's what we're really trying to get to, this holy triangle of, can we have it fast, secure, and stable? And it's about, well, unless you automate things, the answer is no. But um, it's like, how can we reach a state where we have that? And I'm going to talk a little bit about culture. So um, there's, there's, well, there's probably more than three types. But Wallstrom did a really good analogy about three different types. And I'm going to focus specifically on generative. Because if you have a problem, so something goes wrong. Um, if you have read or heard of the Phoenix Project, you know, everything was going wrong. What happens when something goes wrong? Does it lead to scapegoating? Does it lead to justice? Or does it lead to inquiry? See failure as an opportunity to improve the system. 
And in order to do that, you need psychological safety. So you need to be in a state where developers, security operations, and the entire IT, te IT team and you know, wider business can communicate and create this performance-oriented environment. So you have high cooperation, <coughs> you know, risks are shared. Um, I saw a talk, this was about five years ago. It was, I was fairly like, didn't know that much then, but at the time they were talking about SRE, didn't know what it was. But you know, apparently that's you know quite a big thing now. And this woman was saying she was from Google, and she was like, "Yeah, it's kind of like if you were like an F1, and it's like changing the wheels whilst it's driving." So um, that was an outage, and I was responsible. Um, and then I had to, uh, I didn't quite fix it, the problem. I didn't quite do the right thing. I did. So then the damage map was actually quite big. And then when it got to the team, you know, the debrief, she actually put her hand up. Yeah, 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 it was my bad. Could have fixed it a bit in a different way, done it better. But, you know, risk, it wasn't blamed. It was like, oh, okay, well, you seem to have learned. You know what you, know what you need to do. So when we think about the people, we really want to have this cooperation and um, collaborative environment. Okay, 16 minutes. Because you don't want this. You do not want to end up in an unstable environment where things are falling over, heads are rolling, um, and you're having overall a bad time. So how are we going to do this? Quiz next. So where do we start securing DevSecOps? Hopefully this is a bit of a, a, bit of a back to easy. You know, I'm mixing it up. So as the name suggests, we want to start um, shifting left. But before I talk about that, I'm going to mention some useful reading. So if, like me, you like to read tech books whilst you're on holiday by the pool, um, I would recommend DevSecOps by Glenn Wilson, because he's awesome. And also, it's a very good book. I'm not that into reading, but it's very well structured, <coughs> big fun. It was a good holiday read. <laughs> and he, talk <laughs> he talks about these three layers. So education secure by design, and automation. Because when you shift left, I kind of think about it a little bit like inception. You want to go into everyone's brain, like not just the developers, but also everyone in the business, and be like, no, no social engineering. Don't click on that MFA that you don't recognize. Don't click on that link, etc." cetera. Um, so having education. Developers are so busy with backlogs, fixing technical debt, if they do that that um, when are they given the time to train? And things move so fast that you need to allocate time to developers. Similarly, secure by design. How are your systems designed? Are they designed securely? Are you doing threat modeling? Are you thinking about <coughs> code quality? And then automation. Some of you may have heard of Forrester. Forrester and Gartner, they say clever things. <coughs> um, Forrester said a few years ago, manual processes are doomed to fail. So if you don't automate, um, manual processes rely on humans, and we do make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So, the, I, was, um, I was talking to someone from a large German bank, and they showed me two graphs, and I'm going to show them to you. So this is the age distribution, and one of them is for developers, average, and the other one is for video gamers. <laughs> um, and as you can see, they're actually really similar. Um, and the bit, the bit I was going to maybe ask, but I don't know. Um, I could do a show of hands. Okay, who thinks the one on the left is the developers? So I got a couple in the room, maybe like a quarter. And who thinks the one on the right is developers? So a little bit more on that. Well, actually, I'd, I'll go up and show. Maybe I'll shout. So the way I noticed, 0 to 14, actually, developers is this one because they start, you know, around 17, 18. You probably have a couple then. Whilst actually video gamers, you do have some younger people. So, but it was, you know, it's a hard one, and I can see from the audience that um, it was hard to guess. So, with that, um, how, what's the best way to approach this with developers? Moving to the next slide. So, make security fun and easy. So what can we do? Gamification, because what have we just seen? Developers like video games. Everyone likes it. Everyone gets Amazon gift cards. Woo um, so how can we do that? Keeping people engaged. You know, rewards, recognition. So you can do stuff. One of um, my favorite things to talk about and that I've seen live is get your development teams 
set up a safe, separate environment. Half of you red team, so half attacking, half of you blue team, and go. And then what you normally find is the senior developers who know about the skeletons in the closet, they're usually like, OK, OK, I know we're using some bad stuff, so you know, that it's a good way of getting points. And then the junior developers are like, oh my god, is it really that easy to hack? Like, wow, maybe I should think more about author authorization and encryption libraries, et cetera. So having hackathon days is a really good way of doing it. And doing rewards. Like, if, for example, have education as a priority, security training, for example, or you know, just any training, and then, OK, you've done an hour. You've done an hour on Udemy. You can get a gold star. Five gold stars, you get a free lunch or Amazon gift cards. Um, so having, you know, having that way. And then also there are gamified security platforms out there that you can use. And then having things like tournaments, setting up courses, um, and then um, using that to make it fun and easy. The second one, pause for a drink is automation. Because actually, what you don't want to do, you want to have things automated. You want to have it easy. You want to make the best path the easiest path, because then people will follow it. If the right path is a difficult path, certain people will take the easy path. So having things automated, having it reliable, and having it accessible, and within existing developer workflows is a really good way to move forward. So um, this one I quite like, because how can you make things fun and easy? I do a lot of sales training, and I was asked, what is threat modeling? So here we have Bruce Wayne, Batman's threat model. And I think everyone can think about this, whether they're a developer, whether they're security, whether they're someone in HR. What are our assets? You know, what data are we dealing with? Um, so Batman, for example, he has his Batcave, he has Alfred, and then he has his data, which is his emails and his texts. How are we protecting them? Are we using encryption? hiding our location, security system. And also, what are our threats? And this is quite an interesting one, because especially with what's going on in the world, security warfare is going to be, I think, next year, that's going to be, it's going to be painful. You're already starting to see pockets of it you know, come up, because at the moment, um, for example, Ukrainian war fairly focused on themselves. What's going to happen? Fingers crossed as soon as possible when the war ends. It's like, oh yeah, let's just, you know, let's just go after a British sewage company for fun. Like that's the mindset of hackers. Hackers, I think it was, um, I don't know if it was Holiday Inn or Marriott, but one of them got ha hacked. I think it was, um, I think it was a couple in the Philippines. They were just bored, so they're like, oh yeah, let's just put ransomware on the servers. And then incident response noticed. They were like stopping them, and then they'd move, stop, and so missing all the data because they were like, meh. <coughs> So I think it's really important at every level to think about assets, protection, and threats. And explaining it in a fun and easy way is always a good way to get started. So in terms of shifting security left, so this comes back to it being automated, it being easy, et cetera. So have a pipeline. Have security as part of a commit. So when I say security, I'm not just talking about your source code. I want to have everything. I want to have secret detection. I want to have container scanning. I want to have dynamic application security testing. I want to do um, open source components. I want licenses. I want everything. Is that so much to ask? Um, no, that's what you should have. Um, so it's about <coughs> making it as easy as possible for developers, and even better, giving them the results to these tools. Because a lot of the time, if you're failing a build and a developer doesn't know why, that developers are very, very clever people. We'll find a workaround. So empowering developers by not only giving them their results, but also empowering so that they know what they're talking about. Uh, sorry, what they're reading. You know, if I said, I could do a show of hands. Well, actually, it's a security <coughs> group, so we'll see. If I said insecure deserialization, who in the room knows what that actually is? OK, it's a security room. This is good. Normally, no one you know, feel like, what? Um, so anyway, it's about. Shifting security left into the pipeline and into the brains as well. And what tools can you use? So this is when I come to your friendly neighborhood OWASP. So I'm going to have a few shows at the show of hands. I'll move to the other side. Um, who has heard of OWASP Zap? Use the dynamic there. Nice. Uh, what about Cyclone DX? Used for SBOM. Similar show of hands, a few less. And finally, OWASP Dependency Checker. 
Okay, cool, a bit more. So these are some of the better known of the OWASPs, and I'll see if, if anyone's hand is up. Who has heard of, it's probably quite small, but all of the other OWASP projects on there. Okay, we have one, you get the gift card. <laughs> um, so this is the thing, there are loads of tools out there that are available that can help you with this. It's a journey. I don't expect you to be able to implement everything I've talked about tomorrow, but think about the low hanging fruit and think about um, how you can approach this. So, you know, to quote um, Glenn's book, DevSecOps, education, secure by design, automation. You can't automate first, like you probably want to, but actually thinking about what you need and OWASP is a great place to go to. So, next quiz question. How do we measure DevSecOps? Um, so... I'm going to talk a little bit about the Dora metrics. Um, and if anyone has heard, I could do a show of hands. This is actually funner than asking quiz. Everyone say it, all right. Uh, who has heard of or read Accelerate? OK, a couple of people. Would recommend. Everyone's got some homework. Um, so if anyone has read or heard of the Phoenix Project, the Phoenix Project was a fictional tale about DevOps, every single thing that could go wrong. And I speak to organizations all the time. And after every couple of calls, I'll say to my uh, colleagues, I'm like, yeah, that was, just like, that was just like in the Phoenix Project. Yeah, they've got some real problems. Um, so with Accelerate, what they actually did, it's not a fiction book, they asked, they sent surveys to a few thousand companies. So you had um, companies from startups to like massive enterprise. And they're like, what makes elite performers elite? You know, what makes good people good? And what makes low people low? Um, and they came up with these four metrics. So number one, lead time, uh, which can be measured. So for example, how long does it take from, for a commit <coughs> to go, you know, from a, you commit, you write your code commit to it being in production? Is that, is that minutes, hours, <coughs> days, months? So what we found is, uh, what well, the book found, not me, but um, the elite performers could do it in days to hours. And then the low performers would take mm, months. And if you think about the implications of that, for example, if you're working in finance and you want to update all of your mortgage rates with what's going on in the UK at the moment, if you're going to take a couple of months to update that, that's, you're going to have some serious problems. Deployment frequency, so this is a proxy for batch size. If you, um, like I said, talk to a lot of salespeople, and I'm like, remember how we used to have Windows 95 and 98, and now we have 365? <laughs> um, so when you used to release every few years, that's a lot of changes. So what happens when it goes wrong? Uh-oh, that's a lot of changes to sift through. But if you release three changes, that's a lot easier to fix. Or if you just change, you know, if you're... Um, if you have a very smooth process and you're releasing each change, um, like Amazon, then what you'll end up with is if it goes wrong, it's very easy to figure out, oh, that one went wrong and that's what I need to fix. So these ones are quite a lot about throughput, like how fast you go. But it's very important to look at stability. So mean time to restore. Um, how, um, when something goes bad, when the system fails, how quickly can you get up and running? And this one's very, very important for, um, for customers because if they can't use your service, what's going to happen? Probably going to move to a competitor. Is there an equivalent? Um, we see it, say, with social media. It's the minute that um, you know, uh, WhatsApp or Twitter or, any, or Slack, any of these uh, social tools goes down, it's all over the other one because they're like, oh, wow, I can't talk to my friends or, or do my job. So good performers had hours, uh, elite performers, low performers, yet again, back to months. And if you think about it, if you're taking a month to restore your product to your paying customers, that's going to that's gonna really impact you. And then finally, I didn't actually know this was a one before I read up about this. Change failure percentage or change failure rate. So elite performers, 0 to 15%. What it means is I make a change and then it's good. Rather than if it fails, oh no, now I have to do a rollback, I need to do a patch, you know, I've got problems. And it's really important to look at these all four. I was speaking to a very large financial institution, and they had dialed in, thank God, because it was Zoom, and I, I, um, their lead time was 46 minutes, which is very good. And I was talking about this with, with another company, and they were like, yeah, we'd be lucky if we're 46 days. So that's what I mean, variance. Um, so their 46 minutes, really good. Change failure rate. 
Um, so what this means, that over half of their changes fail. So this person was talking to me and he was like, we, okay, we make a change and about half an hour later the build fails and then we have to go back and then figure out, um, okay, where did it fail and then who's responsible for that? And then it was all, it was a big mess of Jenkins pipelines. And then it was like, oh, okay, yeah, Dave does that build, but Dave's, Dave's on holiday, okay, do we know? And he said, and this is someone fairly senior in a large <coughs> bank, it takes us about 50 days to do two days work. And also, all of the you know developers, we hire them, they get frustrated and they leave. Or we hire them and if they stay, it's like, are they really the people we want to stay? <laughs> so when we look at this, we've got the top two, um, which are all about throughput, and the bottom ones about stability. Um, and some good stats, let's see. Oh no, I've lost my timer. Oh, okay, I'm still good. Five minutes, moving back. So, when they looked at elite performance, this is a little bit, um, it's 2019, a little old, still relevant. We can see the changes. If you can deploy 200 times more frequently, or if you're you know, 2,000 times faster, if you can recover your system in hours rather than days, this is going to be pretty good. And what they found was elite, and this is a quote direct from the book. I literally was reading it. I was like, oh, my God, and then I wrote it down. So I'm going to talk about this one day. <laughs> um, elite performers spend 50% less time remediating security issues than low performers. And I think everyone would be happy spending less time remediating. Um, and by having a robust DevOps pipeline, looking at these four metrics, this is how they did it. In terms of what that looks like, hey, have a dashboard where you can literally see. You know, you can have a dashboard, you can see the graph. You can um, look at these stats, look at it on a project basis, look at it on a team basis, bring the gamification in, you know, have a team competitor. It's like, oh yeah, my MTTR is better than yours. Um, I, worked, uh, I worked with someone and they used to work in a bank and on the, um, they had a big screen in the development and that was literally their, um, their score on the security scanning tool. So why don't you use, and that was kind of like an incentive, no one wants to be at the top. So you can do carrot or stick, you can flip it, the best at the top or the worst <laughs> at the top. And you can do that with the Dora metrics. One thing worth noting, beyond Dora metrics, so there was a great um, web page, a report done by, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. And they actually said, Dora metrics are great, but there are a couple of, a couple of things missing. So they did this, it didn't quite fit on the page, so I actually chopped out the normal doors and then added some more. And then these are the ones, personally, which I, I say I really like, but I think are quite important because the, the top two that I've noted, customer issues. So whether it's the volume or whether it's the resolution time, customers are keeping you in business. Your cus paying customers pay your company, pay your bills. So it's important about having happy customers. And this comes back to the product mindset. So if you're having a, lot, a, big, ish, a big issue volume, eh, that's, that's not great. If you're having a big issue volume and you're not responding to them, that's even more of a problem. And then you probably have really stressed support people who are like overrun, et cetera. The other one I mentioned, time to touch vulnerabilities. This is just about risk. Because if you have a lot of vulnerabilities in production, it's just a matter of time. Whether it's you know hackers, whether it's uh, nation states, whether it's malicious insiders, um, it's a good idea to patch your vulnerability smoothly. So the credit ratings agency I mentioned, <coughs> they the, it was a vulnerable version of Struts, and the pa the vulnerability and the patch came out on the same day, and then that probably just got lost in the backlog. Um, and it took them four or five months to notice that they'd even been hacked. So it's important, as well as the Dora metrics, to look at these things as well. So why? Why are we here? Why, why have you been listening so lovely for, for so long? So why DevSecOps? There's a couple of points. I hate reading off the slide, but I am going to do it. So sorry, everyone. Um, so incorporating security into DevOps helps speed up iterations we can innovate faster than competitors. So what happens when you innovate faster than competitors? You're probably going to have a better product for your customers. And what are the customers going to do? They're probably going to move from your competitors to you. You're going to gain market share. So you're going to be in a really, really good space. Second one, vulnerabilities are identified earlier, which helps to avoid cyber attacks. 
This one is especially pertinent with everything that's kind of going on in the world. I don't think anyone wants to be hacked. If you do, okay, that's a bit of like, let's watch, watch the world burn vibe, but anyway. Um, and finally, improving communication and collaboration between teams. Because if you are in a good state of affairs, so okay, your dev and the rest of your team, everyone's trained on security. They get it. They know it's important. Uh, the system's designed securely. It's automated. We're in a collaborative environment. Oh, no, there's a zero day. It's log4j part two. We have the tools to be able to remediate quickly. We know where it is. We can, you know, we can work together. All of a sudden, that is a much more positive environment when different teams, not trying to turn, yourself, turn them into each other, but trying to work together, you're going to have a good time. So, to end, my little summary. So, oh yeah, I just did two slides in a row of reading off, but anyway. Um, number one, take a security first approach. Education, secure by design. Just think about at every level, what are your assets? What are your risks? What are your, th what are your risks and what are your threats? Like, how does it relate to me? You know, you can be an HR, you're like, well, I do have responsibility for everyone's, you know, salary data or contracts. Great, make sure that that's password protected and it's not put on the shared Google Drive, you know? It can apply to everyone. Um, break down silos, we are all on the same team. I think this is especially pertinent with what's happened the last three years, which we seem to have all just, you know, moved on from what was COVID. But everyone has had their lives change. A lot of people have had personal stuff going on. So it's always important to remember that we are working together and you never know what's happening, you know, behind closed doors or behind someone. So, you know, being nice, breaking down silos, working together. And finally, make it fun, automate and measure results. You want to empower your developers. So thank you everyone for listening. My email is Stefania at DevStuffOps. You can find me on my Twitter, my LinkedIn, my website. I do quite like talking. So if you want me to come to your company, to your conference, to your daughter's school, I do all three. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out. And thank you everyone for listening.